Matthew Waters, your supervising sound editor for the comedy mystery Only Murders in the Building, uh, but actually one of the standout episodes of the season, The Boy from 6B, uh, is conspicuous, of course, for the sound it lacks, which is to say dialogue. Um, what were your first thoughts when you learned the plan for that episode? Um, and and you know, what did you think uh, you'd have to think differently about it? Well, it was amazing. So uh, uh, Julie Monroe, the picture editor, uh, called me and said, hey, we have this episode. So I got the script and read it and was thoroughly intrigued. And um, and we uh, uh, so I said, well, let me start doing some some things now. And then they really didn't know how they wanted to go about it. Right. Like, how much do we hear? How much don't we hear? And all that. So Basically, I told them to uh, send me the production tracks, and um, and uh, then I started building these scenes and just kind of see, you know, it's always a process, right? It's not just paint by numbers on something like that. It's like, oh, how's this making me feel? It's almost like composing music to it, if you will. And uh, so, and then the key was to you know, we started going into a direction and then the John, the showrunner, he's like, I don't want to, I don't want to make sure we don't hear any of their words. Right. So then I had to manipulate the words because I still wanted that presence, you know, that I still wanted the scene to be attached to us as a uh, viewer, as a participant. And so I used the production track, but I manipulated the um, voices. I did two different versions and then ended up playing them together. And so you couldn't really tell what they were saying and, and, uh, but you knew that you were hearing that they were saying something that's, that. and then I built an ambience and a background and a kind of like the, uh, inside Theo's world ambience for it as well. And, and how did, uh, you create that ambient sound and, and decide what that would sound like? You know, at first, you know, you kind of just, uh, I just took my ears and covered them. <laughs> you know and uh and then i just remember you know my dad actually uh taught uh taught people how to teach the deaf and so i'd go to gallaudet college in washington dc and and uh i i was around um the deaf community and so you know i kind of remember things that they would tell me from those experiences and you know and then and then it's also about uh just trying to uh keep uh, the viewer engrossed you know just immersed if you will and uh and to be honest with you until we played back after until we mixed the episode and after we played it back i wasn't sure if we went too far if we, i didn't know and then i we watched back the episode and i found myself totally involved in the episode and so i was really happy with it in the end uh, did making a, an episode without any dialogue give you a different perspective on the way you use sound on the show and the way it functions, uh, you know, in a, a regular episode? Oh, for sure. Because, you know, I also had to, you know, there are moments when, uh, you know, the characters get angry or all of a sudden the characters are mysterious to the audience. Oh, what's going on there? And so without the dialogue, I had to come up with some sounds to make uh, all of a sudden it get more intense or it get more mysterious. And it had to be subtle and it had to be part of the ambience. And it actually took quite some time to figure that out so it wouldn't just lay flat you know that was always the concern when they started enjoying uh, uh the soundscape i was providing they wanted to keep it going longer and longer and longer and i didn't think that was going to be the case and so once they decided that it, they, it was going to be pretty much the entire show when we were with theo uh i had to um you know, I had to come up with those uh, moments to make it pop a little bit or, or make you make you feel. And uh, another good another good uh, thing was, you know, then taking the music, like when they're listening to the headphones with Theo and I took the music and I put it through the same processing that I put the dialogue through pretty much. I had to adapt it for the music and then, you know, then mix it in. So it all of a sudden uh, was part of that world. Yet you could still feel the, the music or you could still hear the music and, and all that when he's listening to the headphones and it gets louder. And it was it was challenging. But, man, just what a great experience. I mean, I, I couldn't have enjoyed it more, to be honest. 
now, in general, what goes into the sound design for a show that under normal circumstances is, is built around a lot of dialogue and conversation? Uh, what part of that do you play? Uh, so uh, like on this, on this particular episode, how was it different? Or uh, just, in general? just in general on the show? On the show, well, to, to me, the writing and the acting are mm, tremendous, right? And uh, Joe, uh, the production mixer does, oh my gosh, he does such a great job for us. So, you know, the way I go about it is really trying to make sure that the dialogue is, it saves the performances, is super clean and, uh, and, and keeps the emotion. And I really think that's the player. Like a lot of times when you, when I first read the script, I thought, oh, New York, maybe that's the play, you know, uh, that's the character. And it is kind of a character, but really those three characters, uh, the writing and the acting is so tremendous. They are the show and so i really try and make everything as clear as possible for the audience and still keep the subtleties of their performances so in this particular case i really really start with them and then i work around it and then whatever the story calls for or the ambience or how's how's the uh, uh scene feeling emotionally and are the jokes playing and, and and also the sincerity you know that's one thing i love about this show it's just so sincere it's beautiful so you know, you know, and uh, the show being set in New York City, which is uh, famously or infamously, depending on on how you need to work with it, uh, the city that never sleeps. Mm -hmm. um, how do you work with, uh, you know, just the natural sounds of the city? Uh, the natural sounds of the city. I just, uh, you know, again, it's it's just based on what's going on in a particular scene. You know, and what do I want? You know, sometimes a scene we get outside the Arconia and I want it to be super busy, super aggressive. And then sometimes I don't, you know, it all depends on the mood. I think that's one thing I've learned after doing this for 30 years that uh, just because when I walk outside New York, it's super noisy doesn't mean that it's good for that particular scene. And we have control over that. So let's embrace it. So a lot of times I'll have the layers that are there, but I'll play them back or send them in reverb a little bit. So, they, so you just feel them or sense them, but you're not bombarded by it, right? So you can still pay attention. You can still feel. And, and I mean, there are times when Marty, Steve, and Selena, they, they get very intimate. And, uh, and, uh, um, and yeah, I want to stay away from that. Let them shine. Uh, now, before Only Murders in the Building, you worked on a show that's probably the direct opposite of Only Murders in the Building, which is Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how vast are the differences uh, in terms of your work with the sound on on like an urban comedy like this versus an epic fantasy like that? Mm -hmm. No, that's a that's actually a really great question. And the, uh, for me, the answer, I think, is a little bit surprising probably to most is it's not as vastly different as as, as you think in the sense that pretty much even in only murder, you know, Game of Thrones was based on that world of reality, you know, so we didn't use a lot of, uh, you know, whooshes or, or rumbles to create um, uh, the tension or the feeling we had to use real world stuff. Sometimes the real world was a dragon, but we still had to use the real world stuff. Right. So similarly on this, it's, it's, um, you know, both these, uh, shows are very cinematic, very artful and just very well written and very well acted. And so, you know, sometimes, sometimes the best sound is to stay out of the way. And then, and then sometimes it's not, but so we get to pick and choose and, uh, and uh, and it's great working with uh, showrunners that um, that let you help them in that regard. You know, let the, the, the they trust you in in in, uh, in enhancing the experience as opposed to stepping on the experience. That's what I'll say. Uh, do you think the uh, sound quality on Only Murders would be significantly different if if, if this same material were like uh, approached as a drama? Ooh, that's a great question. Can you ask it one more time? It was too good. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering if like, you know, the quality of sound that you would make for a show like Only Murders would change if it were like, you know, the emotional tone were like drama instead of comedy. Um, you know, uh, I don't necessarily think so on this one because there's a lot of, I don't know if you'd call it drama, but there's just an inherent, a lot of um, emotion in uh in this show. I mean, you really, 
I'll speak for myself. I fall in love with these characters. I love them. I love watching them. And I love finding out about them. And I think on a drama, I have the same kind of a reaction. So I, I don't I don't think and we don't really go for silly and cartoony. You know, this this show isn't that it's very polished and professional. I really dig it. Uh, I'm well, very, very blessed to be a part of it, to be honest. Uh, well, uh, congratulations on your work on the show. Um, and uh, thank you so much for talking with us about oh, it. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. I could I could talk about it for hours, but I know you don't have that kind of time. So. <laughs> Bobby Banks, you're the supervising sound editor for Women of the Movement, which tells the true story of Mamie Till, the mother of Emmett Till. Uh, recounting this story, which is, you know, of course, quite disturbing. Uh, was it especially emotional experience to to work on the show? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I think uh, in, a, in a quite a number of ways. Number one is uh, for me personally, um, as I'm an interracial uh, person, my uh, when I was younger, uh, I actually saw KKK burn a cross on our lawn. Um, and so this was like around 1960. So for me, it was a, you know, a real personal, you know, uh, part of the story. Um, and just to see how people have so much hatred, um, it's just really hard to, it's just hard to digest all the time. It doesn't matter that it was, you know, in 1955, but even if it happens today, you know, so it's just a, it's a real emotional story. Um, and telling this story about the civil rights movement uh, from the point of view of a black woman and the series is directed entirely by black women. Uh, mm -hmm. How did it feel to be able to tell this story with this team, which is unfortunately too unique a team. Like it's, it's unfortunately that it's not, doesn't happen more often in TV. Yeah, it, you know what, it was just really powerful to me because we don't get that opportunity all the time. And especially for us to kind of tell our own story, um, it just makes it feel more intimate for us. Uh, well, for me, especially, um, I think that being a person of color, we bring a little bit more of our own um, sensitivities, I think, I want to say to the project as well. So that's, it was very powerful to be able to work with so many great women. Um, and the, the series takes place in like uh, two major locations, uh, you know, Mississippi and, and Chicago, uh, and a lot of times of rural Mississippi. Um, how did you create that sense of, of rural Mississippi uh, in that period uh, through the sound? Um, I think, you know, because I've traveled to the South, I think that, um, you kind of just, you know, that you know that there's a lot of cicadas, you know, that there's a lot of uh, different kind of winds and stuff, right? Because there's not a lot of, you know, um, machinery or modern things that you have now. So you have to just be really true to that environment in the 1950s. And um, so I did a lot of, you know, searching with other films and things like that from the South to just kind of get more of a soundscape of that time. Um, and also making sure that we use the cars from that era, trucks from that era, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, we all kind of investigated a little bit. Uh, and, and how was the approach different, if it was at all, uh, with uh, the Chicago scenes being that, you know, these are very different locations at the time, especially during the Jim Crow era? Yeah, it's more, Chicago's is, is more city atmosphere. Do you know what I mean? A little bit more bustling, a little bit more um, polished, if, if, if you can say that. Um, and so you kind of think it's Chicago's a little bit more modern rather than more rural uh, Mississippi. So that's another, you know, ways that we approach that and a little bit more of um like in the neighborhood, there'd be more people playing, right? Because now you have a more neighborhood type thing instead of being out in the fields and being a little bit of, you know, houses being further down the road from each other. So that's kind of how we, we approach that. 
uh, the night of uh, Emmett's uh, kidnapping itself um, feels very isolated and unsettling in its effect. Uh, like what work went into creating the sound for that scene? Oh man. Um, you, so you want to try to create some tension with as little as possible, right? So there was a lot of wind that was used. There was a lot, we wanted to also kind of focus on breathing because breathing also br can bring tension, right? Um, footsteps, walking from room to room, you know, where they're searching for Emmett, like, where is he? Um, and so I think that the, the breathing, the footsteps, a little bit of the wind, some creaking of the doors and of the wood on the floors kind of helps to bring that tension. That's, the tension's already there, but you just try to really accentuate it a bit more. So that was our approach to that. Um, and, you know, creating, uh, you know, this period sense of this, uh, you know, both in Mississippi and Chicago, does that require uh, a lot of, you know, work to, uh, you know, sort of isolate out sounds that are too modern or too contemporary that, you know, maybe it's hard to avoid, you know, in a city or, yeah. Um, I, I don't think um, f for the shots that were in Chicago, I think it was more of like neighborhood sounds, cars were different than they would be in Mississippi. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the train station, you know, where you have the bustling of the people and you have the conductors and, you know, those kind of things. And so that kind of helped to, to make the difference between the two. Um, with Mississippi, it's more of like farmland, right? So you have the animals, an occasional truck by, you know, that kind of thing. So that's how, that's how we differentiate the same, those different areas. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, crowd scenes in, in the series, uh, like courtroom, church scenes, press conferences. Uh, what are the sound challenges for scenes like that? Um, well, that's where you have the group come in, right? And so they're going to listen to the scene as it progresses and they're gonna to react to it. Like in the courtroom scenes, um, you know, whether it's coughing or whatever, or when she goes to tell the, tell the story about how Emmett touched her and said things to her. And, you know, so you have to get the response, the reaction from the people in the courtroom to try to, you know, either validate her story or kind of, you know, raise a question, right? And um, then when you had the outside, outside of the courtroom scenes, you know, they're murmuring about what was just said in, in the courtroom. They're having different conversations about it. Some are for, some are against, you know, so you have the group that really you, and then you have to edit it in such a way where you're bringing the audience into that scene. Right. So that's really what the group is meant to do. It's to bring you into that scene to where you feel that you are actually there. Uh, in, uh, in your career, uh, you know, which uh, you've done so much, uh, you know, great work in your career, uh, but you've also been a vice chair of the Academy Museum Advisory Committee. You were president of the Motion Picture Sound Editors. Uh, what has driven you to be, you know, so active in your community of sound editors? Um, I, well, I love what I do. I love that, you know, I just want to, because people don't know what we do. We don't, you know, they don't know what a sound editor does, a Foley, a Foley artist, a Foley editor, music editor, they don't even know that that exists, right? So um, I, I'm so proud of all the work that we do and um, the time that's spent and the craft that is, you know, there's just some awesome people. I don't know, like sound effects editors, I don't even get how their brain works on one side to create an effect, you know, and so I know that there are, you know, the young people coming up, they're so talented, right, but they don't even know that these jobs exist. So one of the reasons why I'm so involved in, in a lot of different committees and stuff is because I want to uh, uh, we want to get on panels, we want to go to schools, we want to tell them, show them exactly what we do, because a lot of their giftings could be like the next music editor, could be the next composer, could be the next Foley artist, right? But if they're, if they don't know that, if it's not brought to them, 
they have no clue, you know, what's really out there. Everything is just not in front of the camera. There's a lot of talented people behind the camera. So that kind of is one thing that just drives me, right? Because I just want to help and just want to show them that people see them and that there's a lot that they could do with their life. Well, uh, I want to congratulate you on your work on women of the movement and uh, you know, all, all of your work within the industry uh, you know, in general. Uh, and so thank you so much for talking with me. Oh, thank you so much. Michael Benevente, you're the supervising sound editor for the true crime murder mystery Under the Banner of Heaven. Uh, it's an unsettling story with a, a dark tone. Uh, what were some of the ways you used sound to create or enhance uh, that tension that's happening in the story? Well, one of the first instructions I got from uh, Dustin Lance Black was that Utah doesn't sound like other places. It's Utah quiet was kind of our theme through the whole show. We wanted to be interesting, but we couldn't be too big sound wise. Uh, even though like the police station where Andrew Garfield's character is based had to not be like a traditional active police station. We hear some voices, but there might be just eight people that work there and half of them are on this case or out. So, um, it was hard because I'm so used to like making things busy, but I had to keep thinking, okay, pull it back a little bit and tell the story in a quiet way. Even in the neighborhoods, you hear kids playing, but not too busy like you might in some other town. Um, so I, I think we achieved it though. I, it's still pretty dramatic, even though a lot of the scenes are very quiet. Uh, I, I can imagine like uh, when you're dealing with uh, a sort of quiet, hushed tone that every individual sound, does that take on a much you know greater kind sure, of- Sure, just uh, people, there's a lot of forest scenes because we deal with some fundamentalism, uh, people sort of in cabins and things, and just the footsteps of our detectives walking through the forest. I, I love that they're, they're there, but that's all you hear you know, maybe an occasional bird. Uh, we just really had to play up the quiet. And I think that actually added to the tension a lot. Um, and, you know, as you were talking about that Utah setting uh, does contribute a lot to the show's uh, atmosphere. Uh, you know, how, how did you work with the natural uh, environment? As you said, you, a lot of scenes in the woods. Right, well, there's, um... There's a lot of insects that we, you know, we did some research on what we could play, what existed in Utah. Um, as a matter of fact, we had a Mormon consultant who came in and told us we couldn't use a particular bug because we, it sounded great. Like I was really disappointed we had to take it out, but his feeling was we didn't want it, we wanted it to be as authentic as possible. So don't use anything that doesn't really exist in the world in Utah. Uh, that being said, just like Salt Lake City is the big city in Utah, but it's not New York City or Los Angeles, it has a whole different vibe. So we had a construction scene there where we just sort of had to play things down, but I think ultimately uh, it really sold it as a different city that wasn't New York or LA. Uh, and, you know, the picture editing on the show, uh, you know, also really contributes to showing us memories, flashbacks, uh, you know, scenes from history. Uh, what was the collaboration like with the, uh, you know, between the two departments, sound and um, we, we We worked well together, I think. Um, there are a lot of flashbacks and some are very quick, like five or six, seven frames in and out. Um, and Lance was great because he let us try things. We have a lot of sound design. My my effects editor, Olivia Zhang, she just went to town. And you never know when you, ha I've never worked for Lance before and just trying the first episode, uh, we were able to try really cool sound design moments just for those flashbacks, which he latched onto, which made me feel really good. He really liked and wanted more. Um, so we, we want to make it scary. There, uh, the music is very intense in this show. Uh, Jeff and Matt from Pearl Jam did it. And it was, I think our sound effects really complemented what he did. Uh, they just play well together. And you never know if that's going to happen. You know, you don't know what the music's going to sound like when you're thinking about sound as a sound person. Uh, and sometimes you get in there and they just conflict. They don't work. And music's always going to win generally. <laughs> so, uh, but for some reason, our stuff, especially in those flashback moments, just played really well with his music. And uh, yeah, I'm really proud of the sound job. I just, and you never know where it's going to go when you start a project. But by the end, and we're, we're mixing the last episode this week. So it airs next Thursday, or drops next Thursday. Um, trying to finish it up. But um, yeah, I think the sound is really working. And um, I like those moments with the flashbacks. And with Picture Editorial, we, they gave us a lot of great input what they wanted. And the, and the Picture Editors did some great sound work in the Avid, which served as a great guide for us. 
and uh, uh, you know when you've got uh, 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 flashbacks to the, the, this Mormon history that you have on the show um, that take place, you know, century or more. In, yeah, in about, the past. about almost exactly a century. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what were there different considerations that went into those? Is it still sort of the same, similar kind of Utah quiet? Well, no. I mean. We had to think about, like, uh, I know Bobby was talking about group ADR. I had to be real specific with group ADR because a lot of times we think in the vernacular of 2022 or whatever we're at, and we had to say, well, would they say that? Would, the, would these pioneers talk like that? So I really had to just sort of think about what would work and what wouldn't work. Uh, it, the, the flashback scenes are great because a lot of them are battle scenes. And so here I'm doing sort of a detective story where I get to have all kinds of gunfire and uh, <laughs> some, some bad stuff happening in the past, but it was really fun for sound. So I, I really enjoyed that part of it and the juxtaposition between the two worlds. Uh, was there, uh, you know, any part of the show that proved to be especially challenging to execute from a sound perspective? Well, there was most, I don't know if you know it, because all of our actors are just so unbelievable. I'd say 90% of them are English. And so we did have some accent issues, but they knew that going in when they shot, you know, they want to give the actor a chance to give his great performance and not have to worry about accents. And then we come in and we loop a lot of them and we don't use all the ADR we shot with them. Uh, Sam Worthington's Australian, obviously Andrew's English, Daisy's English. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge trying to make the dialogue when we came in and redid some of the accents uh, flow seamlessly with what they shot on the set. Uh, we had a lot of dialect coaches who went through the show after it was already edited and gave me notes about things that we should probably change. Um, most of the actors had dialect coaches in their ADR sessions, which helped them. And the actors were great because they wanted to play people from Utah which is a whole different thing. Uh, a lot of times people want to go a little Southern, but Utah isn't in the South. And so uh, we, we, we got it, just working with the actors and um, cleaning up some of the accent stuff. I think that was sort of the biggest challenge for me. Uh, and was there a particular sequence uh, or episode that you're particularly proud of? It's one of your favorites of the season. Yeah, one? I love, uh, and it was something we worked on before I even started on the show. In the third episode, I think it is, uh, the character that uh, Gil Birmingham plays, uh, T Detective Taba, he's wandering through the forest and these fundamentalists have some kind of alarm system when an intruder comes into their space. And when we first started, like I said, before I was even on the show, we started thinking about what would this sound be? It's gotta be somewhat organic. Um, it's you know not an alarm, it's not an electric. So my Foley guys, Randy Wilson up in Toronto, he just did an amazing job coming up with all these pots and pans and cans and things that we could play through the forest as if everybody was trying to say, hey, <laughs> the law enforcement intruders are here. Uh, I love the way it ended up sounding in the mix because it's all around the room. And uh, I actually watched it a couple of times on my own home television because I just wanted to hear it again because I think it sounds really cool. So that was to me one of the most inventive things we were able to do is this whole uh, alarm system because uh, we tried different things and this worked the best. Um, and in addition to working with Dustin Lance Black on the show, uh, David McKenzie directs the first two episodes of the, of the uh, series. So you're really setting the tone with those two. What was it like working with him? Um, I didn't really, I mean, I. I know David, but I, he wasn't really involved once we got to post. So it was mostly Lance and Lance was, you know, the showrunner and, La you know, Lance's ideas, he pushes you to do your best work. He just, um, you know, if thing, if something isn't quite right, we hear about it, but then we get there, which really makes me feel good that we can, uh, you know, help serve his vision. And I think he was pretty happy with the way the show ultimately sounds. Yeah. Um, and you've worked uh, throughout your career in a variety of genres, drama, comedy, uh, action, horror. Uh, is there a particular genre that that you feel most excited to to work in um, and to create sounds for? I don't know. I mean, I, I do have a pretty broad background in a lot of big comedies. <laughs> yeah. um, with comedies, you have to you don't want a, the sound or the sound effects to tell the jokes unless they want you to. I mean, let let the actors and the writing tell the jokes and you guys try to, we try to uh, accent that comedy. A drama is different in that, um, I don't know how to put this. I guess we have, they, they encourage us to really help tell the story. So we're not fighting jokes. 
that kind of thing, you know? So, um, you know, I, I like it all. And I like the fact that I'm able to work on a lot of different kind of things from Moneyball to something about Mary to Howard Stern private parts. Uh, you know, I've, I've been able to do a lot of different things. And this show was great because it was a true serious drama, but we could still have a lot of fun with the sound. Uh, well, I want to congratulate you on your work on the show uh, uh, and, and, you know, you know, can, uh, best of luck on finishing the mix and, and, okay, and all thanks. the editing for this final episode and looking forward to seeing and hearing it. Uh, thank great, you so much great. for talking. Thank you so that. much. Okay, thanks. Jay Price, you're the sound designer for Nat Geo's Welcome to Earth, which follows Will Smith as he travels around the world to experience extreme sights and sounds. Uh, the first episode, uh, The Silent Roar, is all about sound. Uh, so did you approach that episode differently than you would uh, any other episode out in nature? Um, no, I mean, the kind of the whole aspiration for the show was to kind of open up the audience's um, senses to the wonders of the world. And in our case, that was <clears throat> opening their ears to it. And for many sense, the first episode, uh, we were kind of, the approach was um, in the same way how we approached the first episode um, would carry on throughout the whole series. Uh, so, yeah, so the whole, the wonder of how we approach it and how we sound is, well, is to carry all the way through the series, which is um, a kind of a celebration of authentic sounds in nature, but at the same point, not to be limited by that either. So although we were kind of presented with this incredible array of different sounds and um, to you know, we still had the freedom to play with sound design within that uh, to, you know, kind of help tell the story. Um, and, and that episode finds, you know, grandeur and everything from the roaring volcano to the ash against, uh, you know, a windshield. Uh, did, you know, did it give you a, a, a newfound appreciation of kind of how much wonder there is just everywhere if you're paying attention? I think that's what the show set out. And I think it does it really well. And throughout the whole series, and certainly for this episode, it really focuses on going to locations with the purpose of discovering and exploring sound, which as a sound editor, sound designer, was just a really exciting premise to go into it. They're going to the volcano. Yes, you've got the explosions visually, but they were going there to actually record the sound. And the whole point that the loudest sound that's ever been recorded is a volcano. So they're going down with recorders and recording things in there. And to be given this palette of sounds uh, to play with, it was just this, just incredible. Uh, and, and how do you balance uh, those, you know, a lot of those really uh, intense, powerful sounds with, you know, the speech, the conversation between uh, Smith and, and who, you know, the experts he has on? Um, I think Sam, who, who makes it, did a fantastic job with that. So much of the stuff that we delivered is so rich sonically i think a lot of that came in at the mix you know to kind of balance that but this the way that the show um does it you have the extreme noise but also explores silence so the whole point uh, they go into the dolomites and they go all the way down on the hunt for silence um so i think it kind of the idea is to kind of we kind of balance that out throughout the whole show really um, and, you know, what would you say is, you know, some of the most awe-inspiring sounds that you've captured so far on the show? Um, for me, one of the most exciting kind of sounds um, was the sound of the sperm whales. I mean, the, the sound that they make, I think it's about 233 decibels or something astonishing, which is the loudest animal in the whole world. And what they managed to record is with... Um, the hydrophones but what's actually kind of picked up these kind of clicks and this incredible because uh, that's obviously the language that they use and so that was really interesting to get those and also the ice skating i think that's such a an obscure sound that people aren't familiar with they're kind of pew pew the sound like almost like um sci-fi guns i think that's a really interesting sound which uh, most people aren't familiar with and, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, the whales, uh, you know, and, and just sound in general underwater uh, is so different than the way sound travels through air. Uh, is it a different, ex you know, experience or, or considerations to, uh, you know, to, to edit the sound from, from underwater? 
Um, <clears throat> I think yes and no. I mean, what the series was setting out was to kind of a, ce a celebration of all these sounds. But what kind of our job as sound designer, my job as sound designer, was to also deliver the authentic sound, but to deliver the experience of uh, the people in these situations. So, for example, going back to the whales, what we recorded was just they just clicks because hydrophones, they are, uh, you don't get the kind of rich quality that you would do outside, um, outside of water. So part of what we had to create is how it felt. I mean, so much of this, that sort of volume of sound affects your body. You feel it moving through. Um, so designing sounds that was kind of authentic to that experience, as opposed to just replicating what was recorded on the day. It's kind of a big uh, part of the job, really. And really, uh, and a really exciting part to kind of experiment and play with that. Uh, you've done uh, sound work for both scripted and unscripted programs. Uh, are the processes and uh, techniques similar or, you know, is, is it very quite different? I think it, ultimately it's all about storytelling, no matter kind of the medium, if that's kind of film, drama, Nat Geo style shows, it's all about telling the story. And for me, it's whatever we can use, you know, using sound in a way that helps tell that story instead of just um, in a literal, I mean, obviously dialogue is important, but using sound more creatively. I think that's uniform across all platforms, really. Uh, and, you know, Daniel Pemberton's uh, score uh, is also incredibly impactful on the show. Uh, did you want to develop a similar kind of musicality from, from your sound work? Um, I think a lot of what we did was kind of, we, we had the music, when I was doing the sound design. So it allowed us me to kind of uh, work in and around that really. So we're not kind of clashing in the same frequencies and, and giving it space where it needs space. So that was kind of my, my kind of coming into this was to obviously excite that and uh, yeah, a compliment the music really. Uh, what would you say was uh, the biggest uh, challenge that you undertook for the show? Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is kind of recreating uh, w when we get to the end and Will's kind of, he's suddenly very aware and focusing in into the different things that we hear and just building these montages of different sounds um, throughout the show. I think that was a really fun bit and the most challenging bit to get that right. Uh, and also what we did, what I did a lot of was reusing different sounds in different parts. I mean, when they get all the way down to the Dolomites, they leave a recorder and go away. And what they recorded is these sounds, they call them earth tides. So it's the sound of, it's so quiet that you can pick up the sound of the moon pulling against the earth, which is this low rumble. And it goes on to say these earth tides, even New York, it rises and falls by about 14 inches every day. So if you were able to strip back all those sounds, you would be left with this earth tide rumble. So I think they were the most challenging scenes to kind of and most, the most fun to play with. Uh, and someone who works with sound, I imagine you've heard a lot, uh, where, you know, you know, and you mentioned the whales and, and, and also the earth tides. Uh, were there any other sounds that were completely new to you that you had never heard before? Um, what was new is that I've never seen sound before. And this is what this show does. When they go to Mexico, they've got this crazy festival where they kind of tie explosions to the end of a, a, a mallet and they hit the floor and they play in slow-mo and you physically see the ripples of sound. Um, and that was, yeah, for me, that was the first. I've never seen sound before. Uh, well, I want to congratulate you on your work on uh, Welcome to Earth. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for discussing with me today. Thank you very much. Cheers. Matt Skelding, you're the supervising sound editor for The Wheel of Time, which is based on the book series by Robert Jordan. Uh, had you read any of the books before you signed on to the show? Uh, embarrassingly, I hadn't, no. But I certainly have read them now, or at least I've started reading them. There's quite a lot of them. Uh, but no, I hadn't. Uh, and I think it's, it's a huge series in England, but it's, the scale is much bigger in America. It's not as big in England as it is in America. So I was completely unaware of it. But a lot of my friends, once I started speaking to people about it, they'd read it. And yeah, it's got a huge following. 
Uh, did you get any inspiration from the books in, in terms of creating the sounds for this like completely brand new fantasy world? Yeah, I mean, Robert Jordan's writing is so descriptive. I mean, it, it takes a long time sometimes to get to a point because he spends so much time describing the world. So, yeah, it, there was a lot of information, uh, even to as far as the loop group. We don't we could prepare huge Bibles for the loop group of foods they would be ordering, names they could be calling people, what how much everything cost. All that information was there. And we had helpful people within the production who could go through the books and find the right sections for us. Um, yeah, like when we were designing the fade sounds, there were descriptions of that. Loyal had a very, Loyal, I think they described as sounding, supposedly sounding like a, um, a swarm of bees, which obviously doesn't actually translate to film. So it, it always has to be a jumping off point where you can then go and sort of develop further. But it was a great resource to, to start the process. Um, and, you know, with a show like this that incorporates a lot of, you know, magic, uh, you know, how, how do you decide what these swirling kind of mystical magic powers should sound like and, and how were those created? Well, I mean, luckily, Rafe, who's the showrunner, was, has a very strong vision and was very clear how he would like them to sound. And, and they are born out of the elements out of earth, uh, wind. Um, so we could we always try to start with natural sounds and sort of build them through that. And then trying to get that differentiation between the sort of the light magic, the more feminine style, and then the dark magic. So we always knew that there needed to be a vocal component from a very early point. So that's why there's sort of choir elements in there. Um, and then that led us into clashing with the music, obviously. So there was a lot of back and forwards with Lorne, the composer on that point. But yeah, again, it came from the books and lawn and we just and the sound designers ran with it it's really exciting uh and and how do the you know were the sounds of, of the creatures like the fade and and the true locks uh you know decided and, and crafted what were those discussions like um well we were very from a very early point in the process we were doing r d for for rafe the showrunner and the various execs and so we got their feedback early on there's always with these creatures there's uh, a like they need to be grounded in reality. So there's quite a lot of performance involved. Um, the fades, uh, is a, like sort of a lot of feminine, we, the fade needs to sound very feminine. So there's lots of screaming and then not um, lots of screaming elements. And then there's a lot of animals, pigs, uh, pigs, deer, donkeys in the Trollocs. The Trollocs all have their different identities. They all look a bit different. So each Trolloc had its own uh, character. So there's a lot of human elements mixed in with sort of the sort of animal, the more animalistic guttural sort of sound here. Uh, and since the, you know, the sights and sounds of the series uh, work so much together, what was coordination with uh, the visual effects department like uh, to create all of these? Yeah, I mean, we coordinated. There's a lot of back and forwards in that sort of stuff. We would, a huge amount of VFX, obviously, as with most shows, turned up very late because it's a huge amount of work to actually do the VFX. So we had to design sounds before we saw anything. And then that's, those sounds would go as a reference to the cutting room and also to VFX. And they would send us sort of work in progress. Uh, even if it's just a still, it's a good starting point for to, to bounce off. Um, and then... Yeah, like we would design huge sequences and then the VFX would come in and some sequences would work, some sequences you'd have to ditch and start again. But it's sort of kind of the joys of, sort of this sort of show, really. You get to do stuff over and over again. Uh, and creating this fantasy world from the ground up, uh, how, how much goes into just developing the, the ambient sound of just the natural surroundings? Yeah, there was a huge amount in the ambient sounds. I, I, to me, I'm more proud of that than the sort of the creature work that sound designers did. But in the ambience, we had we really wanted to create the ambiences are played very loud in the show, and we really wanted to create envelop the audience in this world. And Rafe was very clear that the ambiences, whilst sounding unique and otherworldly, needed to be anchored in sort of real world sort of animals and experiences. So there was a huge amount of time was spent searching through our recordings and going out and recording animals and then finding the more unusual ones and maybe giving them a slight twist, pitching them or just uh, isolating them from, from uh, real location recordings from around the world. And just 
and then using those ambiences to tell the sort of story as the characters travel on this um, journey throughout the series and they move between these different lands and leave home, just twisting the ambiences and making it feel more threatening as they leave the sanctuary of Green Spring in the first episode and just using those ambiences to help support the story. Really. Uh, and there are a lot of, you know, characters and voices to balance on the show, especially with all the action. Uh, how much uh, ADR goes goes into it? Well, Mark, the location recorders did a really good job. So, um, but that said, there is still a lot of ADR because there's a huge amount of visual effects and, uh, and like sort of practical effects as well and huge amounts of extras on set. And so, yeah, we had to do a fair amount of ADR. The cast, luckily, were amazing at it. Uh, Rosamund particularly, obviously, is a, like just an amazing, and she leads the whole thing, and, and she did loads of work, and the cast were amazing, and a lot of, it was really good to do a lot of ADR in a more creative way, trying to, all the breaths and the action stuff, you really want to, in those fight sequences, you really need to anchor the audience, you want to hear, feel the presence of our stars as they're sort of fighting these trollocs, and give the audience something to latch onto, so there's a huge amount of time is spent doing the ADR and the, the fighting for those sort of sequences. Uh, and it's nice when ADR is not just a, you know, a, a technical process to try and save something. It's nice where you can use ADR to add to something and sort of make it better. Uh, yeah, did you have a favorite sequence from the first season that you were especially proud of pulling off? Yeah, I, I really love the ways, which is the sort of the opening 20 minutes of uh, episode seven which was kind of a crazy sequence because that's, they didn't manage to shoot that before a COVID lockdown. So we actually track laid that initially to a, a previs, like just they recorded loads of voices and then animated it. So we then track laid it and then they shot it later and then we moved everything around. But it's a, a really interesting sequence because we managed to, like there's so much dialogue in the sound design. And I really like it when the sound design isn't just whooshes and stuff that is put on top. It, it's sort of anchored in the world you're hearing the characters' voices within the sound design. It's sort of really, it, it all feels like a fully developed world. And I really like that. Uh, it's really nice. Uh, well, uh, congratulations on, uh, you know, your work on the show. Uh, and thank you so much for discussing it with me. Yeah, lovely. Pleasure. I'm Daniel Montgomery here with sound editors from a wide variety of shows. Uh, you know, Matthew Waters from Only Murders in the Building, Michael J. Benevente from Under the Banner of Heaven, Jay Price from Welcome to Earth, Matt Skelding from The Wheel of Time, and Bobby Banks from Women of Movement. Uh, so I'm wondering, you know, what, what first inspired each of you to pursue the art of sound for film and TV, uh, you know, from the beginning? Uh, let's start with uh, Bobby. Well, um, I personally got in by a fluke. Um, I did not have any intention of being in sound. I, I actually worked at Sound One as a uh, administrative assistant. Um, and then I just spent time, they had a studio that had mixing and Foley um, sound effects editing and things like that. And so I just spent time on my lunch hour and things like that. And um, learned how to clean up the effects library. I learned how to choose effects for clients. Um, and so that's basically how I got into sound. I realized that I was pretty technically inclined. Um, and then they had me like learn six weeks. Uh, I had six weeks to learn, to learn the machine room in the back and to run a mix from the machine room. And um, I wrote down everything in a notepad and um, and then after six weeks, I was able to run my first session. Um, and then from there, I did that for a year. And then I left and treaded the pavement for like three months. And then I got hired on Desperately Seeking Susan, which was McDonough's first film as an apprentice. And, um, and then just went from there, had great teachers and things like that. So that was my start. How about uh, Matthew Waters? How about you? Uh, well, I was a radio TV major in college, and I thought I was going to go into radio and go to some crazy place. But then Stephen Flick won the uh, Oscar for Robocop, and his dad was my teacher. And he came up and talked to us about what he did for a living. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that's everything I like to do. I never knew that existed. And then I was in the Bay Area, and they said I had to move to L.A., 
And so that was my big question because the Bay Area doesn't like L.A., right? And so I was like, oh, my gosh. So then I, the day after I graduated, I moved to L.A. and uh, I was an intern somewhere and, you know, was a studio rat and worked my butt off and uh, learned from everybody that I could. Pretty much had it. Jay? Um, I think I came into it from music, really. I didn't know anything about the world of Sound Post until my early 20s. And I did, um, there was a friend that approached me who'd done a film and said, oh, can you, can you work on the sound post for this? And that's when I discovered it. And I was just like, wow, and same sort of thing. I had no idea that this was a job. And then just pursued <clears throat> every short, short film maker I could find. Um, ended up going to a national film school and then uh, slowly started working as an assistant sound editor. And yeah, it's kind of worked my way up from there, really. Michael? I, um, like Matt, I went to, well, I went to UCLA film school and I um, didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I just wanted to work in the entertainment industry and didn't have any connections at all. But somehow I ended up, well, after a little bit stint in a mailroom, I got a job in editorial for ABC television and they helped me get into the editor's guild. Um, and then all of a sudden I um, got a job on, <laughs> this is how old I am, the original Dallas and Knott's Landing. I was the sound assistant and um, uh, Matt mentioned Steve Flick. Steve Flick was looking for a new assistant and he had just been nominated for Poltergeist and the whole gang had won Oscar for Raiders of the Lost Ark and they needed an assistant and they hired me and I worked as an assistant for probably two years with those guys. And then they said, you know, you're seem pretty talented. Why don't we make you an editor? And so I, uh, became an editor and uh, have worked ever since. I, I'm i a supervisor. I do tend to shoot all my own loops in most of the shows I do because I like to work with the actors and I feel it's a really a good way to get close to the director. Uh, but uh, yeah, so even though I think about retirement every hour, I will probably keep working because I get all these great projects, which I are hard to turn down. <laughs> Matt? Yeah, I, I like various other people on this panel it was a bit of an accident I was studying music at university music and sound recording so on the technical side and we had to do a year's placement at, from university in the industry and I thought I wanted to work in a music studio and do all that and I was interviewing and I went for an interview at a, a post facility called Video Sonics that doesn't exist anymore um, and I was just totally blown away I remember going in the the owner took me into one of the mix stages and they were mixing an M&E and they were mixing the sound of a tie falling into one's soup, I think it was. And it, it just went over and over again. And I just didn't, I couldn't comprehend that I was unaware that this process happened in film. <laughs> and I was just like, from that point on, I didn't go to another music studio interview. Um, the guy at Video Sonics didn't actually want to hire me, but everyone else he wanted to hire got a job before he got around to asking them. So I was the last one left. So I got a job at that facility and I worked there for like nine years as from the T-boy working my way up and then uh, since then freelance just uh, as a dialogue editor and, and supervising as well when I can. Uh, now, uh, as uh, you know, sound uh, uh, artists, uh, editors, uh, you are all very you know, involved in, in of course, uh, the sound process. So I imagine you'd notice it very uh, particularly if you're watching a film. Uh, I'm wondering if there is anything that especially excites you or impresses you about the sound design of a film or a TV show uh, you know, when, you're, when you're watching it. Uh, Matt Skelting. Yeah. Um... I just love anything where the sound is involved in the storytelling. So I always go back to uh, that film, uh, Beast of the Southern Wild, which has amazing sound. And that's that the entire storm that's played inside the hut there. Like it's just, and, and then, and the girl, she goes near the animals and she can feel the heartbeats and stuff like that. Anything where the sound is used in a really subjective manner and it's helping the story. I just, yeah, it doesn't matter how big or how small the film is or the project or the TV show. That's what I love. Michael? Um, I'm thinking about films that I thought sounded really great this past year. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, like in Belfast, they made such great choices in that film. Things that I, you know, I get jealous when I hear good stuff. Like there, you know, it's an interior scene in a house and you hear kids on the street playing. A lot of directors won't let you do that kind of stuff. And when I heard that film, I thought, man, that's a good choice by the sound editor an even better choice by the director. And it really enhanced my experience listening to the film. Um, I love when cool things like that happen that 
I know from experience, I've had a couple of those ideas shut, shut down. <laughs> and so when those ideas get through, they can do different kind of cool things. It excites me. Jay? Um, kind of mirroring the same thing, really. I think it's just when, when you see part of the storytelling, and I think comedy can be really good for that, um, where you just kind of pick out kind of small moments um, that just really help elevate and, um, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matthew? Um, yeah, just as every everyone said, I mean, I just think back to Heavenly Creatures a uh, long, long, long time ago. And uh, and uh, the character puts a has a brick in her purse and you wait for the whole film and she puts the brick on the table, her purse on the table. And it sounds like a brick in the purse. And the whole audience goes, oh, my gosh, this is about to happen. And I remember right then going, wow, man, what a great yeah. choice of a sound right there. So, you know, and I also like anything that I haven't heard before. I love custom stuff. I love when I go hear a film because we've all been doing this for so long when I'm in a film and I'm going, oh my gosh, I've never heard that before. That's amazing and it sounds great. So I like that. Bobby? So I like really big crowd scenes, right? Because it just envelops you. I just want to feel what's going on in that scene. So I just love big crowd scenes. And I also know how hard it is sometimes to achieve between effects and ADR group. Um, but I also like really good effects. Like I like wind storms. Like I like to feel, I like to hear like sand, like just little particles, right? Or fires where if I'm looking at something, it's like, man, I want to feel the heat of the fire. So I just love effects that way. And um, in Baby Driver, where they had the effects and the music was just, it was powerful the way that the scene played. So I just love those kind of things. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, you know, be, having worked in, in the business for, uh, for years, uh, all of you have uh, quite a lot of experience. What have you learned that you wish you kind of knew about the business when you were starting out, uh, Michael? Um, one of the things I think people worry about is like to try for, to hope that problems don't arise. Problems in post-production are gonna arise constantly. The key is how you handle those problems. And the thing you're worried about generally doesn't even take place. It's something that comes out of left field that you didn't even plan for. And as I've gotten older and more experienced, I firmly believe in not panicking. I, I can generally fix something somewhere. I, you know, if I didn't record an actor to do that certain thing, I think, oh, I could grab that from there. And I think all of us, as we get more experience, just get more, much more confident and uh, hopefully less panicky, at least I am. Bobby? Um, I would say also um, don't take things personal. Um, you know, a lot of times people, you never know what kind of day or morning somebody's had. And, you know, so some of the things that you might encounter with people, it really has to do with them a lot. And so just really to be a person who can study people and to really help people feel at ease because everything is just so intense and people are just on edge all the, a lot of the time. So when you're that voice of um, reason and, you know, it's going to be okay and giving solutions and things like that, I think that that's very helpful. Uh, Matt Skelding? Um, I think, I think it's to, like, to seek out nice people to work with. I don't know if I necessarily did that initially, like because I guess you don't have that opportunity. But like I know now that I just... I'm in such a privileged position now that I just work with nice people and in the sound team and beyond that in sort of production and, and, and yeah, like just put more thought into who you're working with, I think, and just work with nice people who treat you nicely and want to make good, good TV and good film. I think that's, yeah, that's what I should have done more of. Uh, Matthew? Uh, uh, you know, for me, it was just, it, it uh, you know, I think it, it all is our steps, you know, and experience and stuff like that. And, uh, I think the biggest one for me was, uh, two things, realizing that most people don't know what we do 
and you think they do. And so you have to be vocal and explain that, oh, I've got this, I'm doing this. Oh, well, you know, they didn't know that. And then I guess the other thing is, you know, in a sound uh, design perspective, you know, when I first started, I just wanted to make the coolest sounds. I actually didn't probably even pay attention to what was on screen. And now I realize through years, it's actually all about what's on screen. And that's what matters. And that's what's cool. Jay? Um, <clears throat> for me, I think it's the same thing of like taking a step back and really understanding what it needs is, you know, before I've kind of really worked on seeing all these sounds in there and it's all kind of like, yeah, it's great. And the director come in and go, mm, let's, can we strip it all back? And you sit back and you go, yeah, that works better, doesn't it, actually? And it's just like, sounds not always the answer, I think. And, you know, less is more. I think that's one thing I kind of got to really. <laughs> Um, and, you know, last question, um, is, is there a particular genre or setting that uh, you haven't worked in uh, that you would very much like to, to create sound for, uh, Matt Skelly? Yes, because I'm English. I just want to do a Western. And I'm never going to get asked to do a Western in my entire career, but that's what I want to do. And it's yeah. never going to happen. I just want to interject because you don't even have to wait for me. That's exactly what I want to do. I really, 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 before I finish, want to do a Western. Well, I think you've stand more chance than I do. Really. <laughs> uh, well, you never know who's watching this. So, you know, uh, just just to, to let anyone know who's directing or producing a Western, uh, you know, <laughs> to give you a call. Uh, Bobby? Um, I've not done a musical yet. So I think that that would be great. So that's it for me. Uh, Jay? Um, I think 3D animation. I think that's one thing I haven't really explored. That'd be something I'd be very interested to try. I think building the whole world from scratch. That'd be very fun. And, and Michael? I haven't really done much sci-fi. I was, I just actually turned down something sci-fi because it didn't work out schedule-wise. But I think that might be interesting because you're creating a whole uh, world that hopefully no one's heard before. I know it's kind of cliched, but... Um, that's part of the job. And I think that might be kind of challenging in trying stuff in a sci-fi setting. Uh, well, uh, I want to congratulate all of you again on uh, the work you've done. Uh, uh, all so, so different and so exciting to talk about. And uh, thank you all for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, so thank much. you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you.